Okay, so we are officially recording. So we're going to be working on lesson 4.4, which is our transformations of exponential functions. And these transformations are very similar to all of the transformations we did with all of our parent functions in unit one. So when we're transforming our exponential functions, we're still using this here, where f at x is equal to b, but this time our k times x minus d is in the exponent, which makes sense because that's where our x is. That b there represents our base, so all of our different exponential functions will have different bases, so maybe it's 2 to the x, 3 to the x, something like that. Again, we have our c on the outside, not touching anything that has to do with x. So let's quickly go over what all of our letters do again, and they actually all do the exact same thing as they did in unit one. So our A is responsible for a vertical stretch if A is bigger than 1, or a vertical compression if A is between 0 and 1. Remember with A and K that we look at just the number on its own to determine our stretch or compression, and then we look at the sign independently. So if our A is negative, then we've had a reflection over the x-axis and our graph will be upside down. Next is k. So for our k, if k is between 0 and 1, I have a horizontal stretch by a factor of 1 over k. Remember that when we're talking about our horizontal stretches or compressions, that we always say a factor of 1 over k, not just k. Then for our horizontal compression, if k is bigger than 1, we would say we have a horizontal compression of 1 over k. Finally, if k is negative, we have a reflection in the y-axis. So instead of it reflecting upside down, it's going to reflect sideways. Now we have two more. So d is responsible for our horizontal shift. So if d is positive, then we're moving to the left. And if d is negative, then we're moving to the right. And then for c, if c is positive, we're moving up. And if it's negative, we're moving down. So all of those are exactly the same as they were before. The only thing that's different is our parent function. So let's go through and quickly remember how to write out our transformations. So when we write out our transformations, we always want to start by identifying our A's, K's, D, C. And if it's not there, we don't need to worry about it. Because if I don't have a value for it, it means it's not transforming my function at all. So first we have our a value here. And our a value is negative 3. So because it's negative, we have a reflection in the x-axis. So it would be flipped upside down. And then our a value is 3. So that means because that a value is bigger than 1, we have a vertical stretch by a factor of 3. Next, we have our k value here, this little 2. And now we can write what our k value does. So our k value is positive. So we don't need to worry about any sort of reflections because of k. And then we have a k value of 2. So because our k value is greater than 1, we will have a horizontal compression this time by a factor of 1 over k, and our k is 2. So always remember with my k, it's always a factor of 1 over k. Finally, I have my little c value over here. That plus 1, that's just tacked on to the end. And that will give me a vertical shift. Shift or translation. You can use either word. Shift is just quicker to write. <laughs> 1 unit. And because it's positive, I will be going any questions about that first one so far? 
Hopefully this is coming back from unit one. Same idea, we're just using it in a slightly different way. Okay, let's try our next example. So for this one, we have y equals 2 to the power of negative 3x plus 6. Now if you remember from unit 1, any time I had a number in front of a k and there was a d value, I always had to factor that k out in order to get the proper d value there. I can't just use it as is or else I'll get the wrong d value. So please always make sure to factor that out. And now we can identify our k value and our d value. So our k value here is negative 3. So because our k is negative, we'll have a reflection in the y-axis. And then because our k value is 3, which is greater than 1, I'll have a horizontal compression again by a factor of one third. So remember that we always have to do one over k. We're talking about the factor that we're stretching or compressing by. Finally, we have a d value right here. So this is responsible just like before for our horizontal translation or horizontal shift. So we would have a horizontal shift, two units, and because it's negative in the equation, we'll be moving to the right. Any questions there before we start getting into graphing these things? So far, so good. Okay, so let's quickly remember how we graph our transformations. So first, we're going to draw the parent function. Oh, Afshel, feel free to type your question in the chat. As you're typing that, I'm just going to quickly go through this. So first, we will identify and draw the parent function. Then we'll perform um, our transformations. We'll do our stretching compressions first. Then we'll reflect. Then we'll translate. Sometimes I like to switch these around, but that part doesn't matter too much if you do that slightly out of order. And make sure we label all our intermediate ones. Um, so Afshal, your question was, wait, do we get bigger two? For which one? Would you mind clarifying which one you're talking about? Oh, with the bigger two. Never mind. I've understood what you're asking. I think you're asking about this one. And same with this two here. So this is what's a little different about our exponential functions. So my parent functions for both of these is this. y equals 2 to the power of x. And then we start changing everything around there. So that bigger one there is telling me what my parent function is. And I think that will make some more sense when we get to the actual graphing examples below. That way you can see how our parent function actually impacts our graph and the transformations. That's a good question. That's why this one, it's the same principles as everything in unit one. It just looks a little bit different because we have these extra base numbers floating around. Okay, so let's go through a few examples together. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to state our transformations. We'll find our parent function. We'll graph it, and then we'll find our domain and range. Um, Ethan, can we have negative numbers in an exponential function? So we cannot have negative numbers as our base. So this here, that two, cannot be negative. However, once we flip it and do all the funky transformations, we can have values that are negative. Um, and I'll show you some of those below. But our base here, this number, will always be a positive number. So hopefully that answered your question, what you were looking for. 
Okay, let's go through an example because I think that that will help clear things up for everybody. So, our equation here is y equals 3 to the power of x minus 1 minus 4. So the first thing that we need to do is to identify our parent function. And we identify that by the number that has the exponents on it. So because the 3 has exponents on it, our parent function is y equals 3 to the power of x. So let's start by graphing that. So when x is 0, we have 3 to the power of 0, which is 1. When x is 1, we have 3 to the power of 1, which is 3. When x is 2, we have 3 to the power of 2, which is 9. And then, yes, Keith, you can type your question in. Then when 3, when x is negative 1, we have y is a third, and then we have a ninth. Are we still using f of x? So for our... For these questions, we do not have to use f at x. You can if you want to, but we can just use xy notation for our exponential functions. If you want to go through and use f at x, that's totally okay though. All right, so here is my parent function. Like this. And I'm going to label it that that is y equals 3 to the power of x. So if you need to, you can absolutely make a table of values for that. You will get the hang of how to graph these pretty quick. So now let's identify some transformations. Yes, Ethan, you can type your question in the chat. Yeah, so we can algebraically figure out where the asymptote goes. There is a pretty easy way to tell, though, from the equation. So I'll show you in a moment. Um, but the equation makes finding the asymptote actually really, really easy. So I'll show you how to do that. And understanding that will really help you in the next lesson when we're going backwards from the graph to the equation. So I'll show you how to find it because finding the asymptote is pretty um, quick, actually. So let's identify some transformations. First thing I need to look at is see if I have any stretches or compressions or reflections. So because I don't have an A value here or a K value, there are no stretches and compressions, there's no reflections, so I can move on. Next, I look for a D value. So because I have D is negative one here, that tells me that I have a horizontal shift one unit and because it's negative in the equation we will say that we're moving one unit right so now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to move all of those points one unit to the right and your fraction points so like a third and a ninth they're not going to be perfect, but I, I always take that into account when I'm marking hand-drawn graphs. So if they're not perfect, don't stress about those ones. The main point is we know that it is approaching the x-axis and won't touch it. So now we have y equals three, x minus one, like that. So that is our first transformation. If I look at it, I do want to notice that my asymptote is still the x-axis. So it's just moved over to the side, but it's still approaching my x-axis there. Okay, let's look at our second transformation. So I have this negative 4 at the end as my c value. So that means that I have a vertical shift four units down. So now I'm just going to move all of my points four units down. 
It's going to look something like this. So that is what my graph looks like. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go a little out of order of the sheet, but I'm going to try to find my asymptote here. And if I look, all of my points get really, really close to this line here. And that's because my asymptote was originally at zero and I brought everything down for units. So when I bring everything down for units, I also bring my asymptote down for units. So let's write out our asymptote. So that's at y equals negative 4. And if I look at my equation, where do I see that number negative 4? Well, that is my c value. So my c value always tells us where my asymptote is. So I can always just take this c value and know that's where my asymptote is, regardless of if it's been reflected or stretched, whatever. If I have a C value, it's giving me my new asymptote. Yes, Dimitri, feel free to type your question. As you do that, I'm just going to find my domain and range. So if I look, there's nothing stopping my X's because that bottom of line is going to go on forever. So my domain is X is an element of real numbers. And then for my range, if I look, all of my points get very, very close to four, but we know that they'll get smaller and smaller and smaller and won't actually touch four. So that means that my range is y is an element of real numbers such that y is greater than four. And remember, we say greater than here because it cannot equal four. It's going to get really close, but it won't equal four. Um, Dimitri, so is that just another way of writing the equations? So, uh, Ethan, while I'm explaining this, feel free to type your question. So this here is just another type of parent function. So instead of using x squared, our, which is a quadratic, instead of using our absolute value function, something like this, this is just a brand new function that we're going to be looking at. So if you go back to the lesson before this, it gives you a little more clarity on what that is. But we approach the transformations in the same way. Um, Ethan, you can turn off your mic if you want to say it if you can't type it. So shouldn't we like say that x does not equal 0 for the domain? I mean, x does not equal negative 4 because it doesn't equal negative 4 as well. So, so my x could equal negative 4. So I could have a point on x at negative 4 down here, right? So this blue line here is going to keep going and get really, really close. And I will have a value right here, something really, really close to 0, a really, really teeny fraction <coughs> that's down here. And I can have an x value of 4 for that. But all of my values have to be above this line, which is all of my y values. So my y values are stuck from the asymptote up. My x's can go anywhere across here. Like I can have any value for x and plug that in. It's just that my y's are limited they have to be above the red line. Oh, so it's Y. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I see. All right, thank you. No problem. Um, Turth, does that also answer your question as well? I know it seems weird kind of that intuitively it seems like it should be X, but because we have everything above that line, that's why it's the range. 
So hopefully, shouldn't the range be bigger than, oh, yes, sorry, misread your question, Ter. Got it, though. Okay, so there's our first example. Let's do a few more of these, because I think if we do a few more, it will continuously help people understand. Okay, here's our next example. So we have y equals 2 to the power of negative 2x plus 2. So remember that when we have a k value, we always need to factor it out if we can. So I'll negative 2, x minus 1. So that is our actual equation. So be careful with that because it's very easy to forget to do that and accidentally have the wrong d value. So now we look to figure out what our parent function is. And because the big two is the one with all the exponents on it, that is going to be our parent function. So let's start by graphing our parent function. So two to the power of zero is one, two to the power of one is two, two to the power of two is four, to the power of three is eight, like this. Two to the power of negative one is a half, and two to the power of negative two is a quarter. So now I'm just going to connect these in a nice line, like that, and I'm just going to label it. That's y equals two x. Next, we start identifying our transformations. So the first thing I want to notice is that I have a k value. So I have a little k value here. And now let's write what the k value does. So because my k value is negative, I'm going to have a reflection in the y-axis because it's negative. And then, because it's a value of 2, I'm going to have a horizontal compression by a factor of 1 over 2. So remember, we always say 1 over 2. So if you're looking at my um, solutions here that I posted earlier, I'll repost them again because I realized I forgot to do the reflection in my um, solutions that I post on Classroom. So if you're looking at those, just be mindful that I did forget that. So I'll post this newer version as soon as we're done here. So let's start by doing our horizontal compression first. So it's always a good idea to start with our compression and then we'll move it all over and do the reflection. So when we do a horizontal compression, just like we did in unit one, we're going to multiply all of our x's by one half, or in other words, divide all of our x's by two. So let's do that. So our graph is going to look something like this. So all I've done is I've multiplied all of my x values by a half or divided them by two, that's the same thing. Now we're going to do our reflection in the y-axis. I'm just going to do this in this other color just so you can See the difference? Actually, I can do it in a different pink. So all we're going to do is we're reflecting over the y-axis. So we're just going to flip it this way is the idea. So this one will go over here. This one will go over here. <laughs> go. So it'll look something like this. If you're finding that your little fraction points are getting a little bit off, don't stress, that's okay. Those ones are really hard to keep exactly accurate. As long as you're keeping track of where your asymptote is, that's what really matters. 
Yes, Dimitri, do you want to type your question? Or you can turn off your mic if you want to. Sure, we're actually going, uh, I guess we're not talking about the asymptote just yet. So the asymptote is this line here. See how our graphs all have this kind of funny shape that go like this? So if I, oops, if I zoom in to these, and I look, it's hard to do this on a drawing, but if you did this on Desmos, you would see it. If I looked, my lines will never touch the x-axis. They'll get closer and closer and closer. So my answers will be a half, a quarter, an eighth, one over 32, and they'll become littler and littler fractions, but it will never ever hit that. Um, Jansen, how did I know that there was a horizontal compression of a half? So because I have a k value here of negative 2, if I look up at the top here, when I have a k value, and it is over 1, I have a horizontal compression, and I always say by a factor of 1 over whatever k is. So if you need to, you can absolutely scroll up and go through, kind of use that as a little reference sheet for right now. Okay, so I've dealt with my K. Oh, Dustin, you have a question. Do you want to type it? Or you can turn off your mic and speak if you prefer. So not all functions have an asymptote. Our exponential functions do, and it's just because we have that x as an exponent. Um, our, um, our inverse ones do, 1 over x, that one also does. Um, our quadratics don't, right, because it can go hit a vertex and turn around. So there's some that do and there's some that don't, and they all just come from the actual parent function itself. So here when I have two to the power of x, I'm not going to get any numbers below um, zero. I'm not gonna get any numbers down here unless I go through and transform everything. So just with the actual like, definition of an exponential function, I'll always have an asymptote so it's always just dependent on whatever the parent function is. Some do, some don't. But all of these for unit four, they all will. So you know that for sure. Okay, so that is our k. We also have a value for d here as well. So because d is negative one, we're going to have that we horizontal, shift one unit and because it's negative in the equation we're moving to the right so let's move all of those dark pink points one to the right there we go so it's going to look like that that will be y equals 2, negative 2, x minus 1. And that is our final answer. Now we're going to look at where the asymptote is. So if I look, my final orange line is going down and gets really close to here, but it doesn't actually touch the x-axis. So the x-axis is still my asymptote. And the other way I know that is I don't have a c value. So we haven't moved it up and we haven't moved it down, so my asymptote does not change. Next is my domain. There's nothing stopping my x's. They can go on forever going this way, and they can go on forever as they're going up. It's just going to keep going this way. My y's though, if you notice, there's no y values below the x-axis, they're all above. So that will tell me 
that my domain can be any real number and my range can be any real number, but it has to be bigger than zero. Any questions so far about that? Okay, let's try another one. And we'll just keep going with these and keep practicing them. And the more you see them, the more you'll start to pick it up and understand. Okay. So my next one here, we have negative one third times three to the power of x plus four. So first let's identify the parent function. So the parent function is the one, the big number that has the exponent on it. So in this case, that is three to the x. So let's start by drawing our parent function on the graph. So three to the power of zero is one, three to the power of one is three, three to the power of two is nine, three to the power of negative one is a third, three to the power of negative two is a ninth. So I'm just going to connect those in a nice line like this. There we go. And then I'm going to label it like that. Now let's start getting into our transformations. So the first thing I'm going to look at is my A value. So if I look out in front here, I do have an A value of negative one third. So because my a value is negative, I have a reflection in the x-axis. And then my a value is 1 third, which is between 0 and 1. So I would say that we have a vertical compression of 1 over 3, like this. So now let's graph this. It's up to you. You can do the reflection first or the compression. It doesn't matter. You just want to do those two things before you start doing any of the translations. So it's up to you, whichever one you want to do first. I'm going to follow the rules on the worksheet and do the compression first. But if it's easier for you to do it the other way, that's fine too. So when I do a vertical compression, because it's vertical, I'm going to be multiplying my, um, oh, sorry, Dustin, I didn't scroll down and see your question. Uh, why are the horizontal compression stretch written as a rational instead of a whole number like the other parent? So my, for my Ks, we always write one over K. Even in unit one for all the other parent functions, we always use one over K no matter what. So that is also consistent here as well. So that's nice that it's the same across the board. Um, okay, so let's start with my vertical compression. So what I'm going to do is I multiply all of my y values by a third or divide them by three. So nine divided by three is three. Three divided by three is one. One divided by three is a third. And these ones just get really little. <laughs> so sometimes, if you just know it's gonna get really little on your graph, you can just graph them nice and little like that. We haven't moved up or down, so my asymptote is still at y equals zero, so I can just get really close to that line. So that would be my compression. And now let's do the reflection. So now it's reflecting over the x-axis, so it's all gonna go upside down. So we'll have one right here. There we go. There we go, so I flipped it upside down like this. And I'm just going to label it. Y equals negative one third times three to the X like that. So now we've dealt with our a value. 
now we're going to deal with the C. So we also have a little C value over here. So that is going to move our asymptote around. So when I have a C value of positive four, we're going to have a vertical shift up four units. So I'm just going to move all of my points up four, which also moves my asymptote up four. So here we go, something like this. So we'll have y equals negative one third, three to the x plus four. And now you can see that my asymptote, all these points are getting really, really close to four, but they're not touching four. So that is my new asymptote there. So let's fill out the questions below. So my domain, still nothing is restricting my domain. My x's can go on forever and ever. So we'll still have x as an element of real numbers. And then for my range, if you look, all of my range is below the red line like this. So all of my y's are real numbers. And I say they're real numbers because they're connected with a nice line such that all of them are less than positive four. And finally, where is my asymptote at? My asymptote is just at y equals four. And if you want, you can even just see that this is a four and write this in. That's absolutely fair because it will always just be my C value no matter what. Okay. Any questions before we move on to our last example? Okay, I'm just going to actually, no, we should be okay. I'm just gonna do attendance again quickly, but I think everybody's here. Okay, one more example. So this last one has negative five multiplied by one half to the power of x plus four plus three. So first we start by identifying our parent function, which because our big number with the exponents is a half is y equals one half to the power of x like this. So let's start by drawing our parent function. So one half to the power of one is a half, one half to the power of two is a quarter, one half to the power of zero is one, one half to the power of negative one is two, and one half to the power of negative two is four, three is eight. There we go. So I'm just going to connect those all in a nice line and label my parent function. As you can see, we're getting very, very close to the x-axis, but not touching it because that is our asymptote. There we go. Okay, let's start identifying our transformations. So first we look to see if we have an A value, and we do. So because our A value is negative, we will have a reflection in the X axis like that, and because our A value is greater than one, we will have a vertical stretch by a factor of five. So let's start by dealing with our stretch. So because it's vertical, we're multiplying all of our Y values by five. So the first one, Eight times five is off the graph. If it's off the graph, just leave it for right now. Don't worry about it. Uh, four times five is 20. Two times five is 10. So we can graph that one. One times five is five. Half times five is five over two. 
A quarter times five is five over four. And we haven't moved up or down, so we'll keep getting closer to our x-axis because that's still our asymptote. So it's always a good idea to keep track of where your asymptote is, just so you know where your line is going to curve to, especially when I start moving my points all around. It's always a good idea to know the shape of your graph with the asymptote. Okay, so that is our first transformation. So we've done our vertical stretch by five. Now let's do the reflection. So we're going to flip everything upside down over the x-axis. Here we go. And remember that our asymptote is still the x-axis. So we're still going to be getting really close to the x-axis. There we go. Now let's look for a k-value. We don't have a k-value, so we move on. Next we have a d-value here. So d is positive 4, so we have a horizontal shift four units to the left. So remember, because it's positive in the equation, we're moving to the left. So let's move our points four units to the left. There we go. And remember, we still haven't changed our asymptote yet. So we're still getting really close to the x-axis. There we go. And now we have our final transformation. So because I have this three on the end, I have a vertical translation of three. So, we have a vertical shift, three units, and because it's positive, we're going to move up. So let's move all of those points three units up. There we go. So remember our new asymptote is going to be along three so we're going to get really close to three. So that would be our final one, y equals negative five, one half, x plus four, plus three. So my new asymptote is now at three because of that c value. So our last thing we're going to do is let's state our domain. So there's nothing stopping our x's so our domain is just an element of real numbers. And then for our range, all of our range on our blue line here, they are all below that asymptote line of three. So we have that my y's are all elements of real numbers such that all of my y's are going to be less than positive three. And then my asymptote is at y equals three, which I can always just take from that. So that is all of our examples. Are there any questions before I send you on your way to do some homework problems? Okay, so if there are no questions, feel free to sign off. We will have a meeting at 3.15 just because there's a few things I want to talk to you about. So please actually come back here. Um, type here because it does help me with attendance. That would be great. Um, but 3.15, okay? So 3.15, I need everybody back, please. And then we should be good to go. So you are good to leave the meeting. Thanks guys, that does help me with attendance so much. You don't even know how, how big of a help that is.
Okay, so if you guys don't have questions other than, let me just make sure there's no questions in here, just a bunch. Oh, I know, that's okay. Oh, the recording's still on, you're right, I forgot about that, thank you. 